back, everybody. Next up, we have Ashley Turretich. We're welcoming here to Superpod for the first time, by the way. <laughs> Ashley is a former trainer. She was a trainer for 14 years at Golf World in Panama City, Florida. And she is inspired to come here and tell you her story. Welcome, Ashley. Hi, Superpod. <laughs> My name is Ashley. I'm so glad to be here and very humbled this morning by the opportunity to tell you a little bit about my personal experience as a former trainer. <clears throat> I had a really hard time coming up with a title for my talk. I tried coming up with clever titles, but ultimately decided on For Sandy. I chose For Sandy because of a dolphin of that name I worked with my entire career as a trainer. I learned a lot over the years from all the animals I worked with but Sandy was extra special to me. She was my greatest teacher. She was one of the last wild caught bottlenose dolphins for captivity. I wish things would change for a lot of reasons, but my biggest reason is for her. I got into dolphin training differently than most. I actually have my master's degree in political science. A uh, hike on the portion of the Appalachian Trail made me rethink law school. I didn't think that arguing for a living suited me. So the universe took me down a different path. During graduate school, I started training my dog as a therapy dog to visit hospitals and senior care facilities. And I was also working as an admissions counselor for the university. Almost every weekend, I went home to New Orleans to fulfill volunteer shifts at the Audubon Aquarium of the Americas. I loved teaching people about marine animals, their habitat, and conservation. I was passionate about it. I eventually earned a coveted position on the aquarium's dive team, diving weekly to feed animals, interact with guests, and clean the habitats. I loved every minute. I was chosen to go on an aquarium research trip to the Bahamas, scientifically tagging sharks and observing and documenting coral spawning. I remember seeing the Milky Way so vividly on the dive boat at night and the experience was life-changing. Now, I've always been passionate about the water and all the creatures in it. So as I looked for what I wanted to do next, I decided to become a scuba instructor down in the Florida Keys. My first dive master and instructor job was working for the Living Seas at Walt Disney World's Epcot. I worked as a guide for the Dive Quest program and as Scuba Mickey's safety diver. Yep, Mickey is a saint, Mickey does dive. Um, there's a character version of him that does scuba dives and the seas for events and occasional appearances. And it was really fun. Life eventually brought me to Panama City Beach, where I still live. There's a small marine park there called Gulf World Marine Park, and I got a position there working in the marine mammal department. The beginning was like most newcomers to the field with tasks such as scrubbing buckets and preparing hundreds of pounds of fishy diets. Slowly, I worked my way up the ladder to include more and more. I mentioned Gulf World is a small park. This differs from bigger parks you're familiar with in a lot of ways, some which are obvious and some which aren't very obvious. Most bigger parks have separate, excuse me, most bigger parks have separate teams for animal care, training, husbandry, rescue, etc. A small park like the one I worked at had one marine mammal team and we did all of the above and more. I learned things like feeding, water testing, filtration, rescue, training. The more seniority I gained, the more opportunities were provided to learn to move up. This was the start of my career, a career I couldn't believe how lucky I was to find myself in, a career I was very proud of. I've worked with bottlenose dolphins, rough-toothed dolphins, California sea lions, harbor seals, river otters, and black-footed penguins. For the sake of superpod, I'll stick to talking about the dolphins. During my 14 years in the field, I worked with wild-captured dolphins, captive-born dolphins, stranded dolphins that were rehabilitated and deemed non-releasable, and retired Navy dolphins. I eventually found myself 
participating in all areas of stranding response from on scene at the beach and rehabilitation, including bottle feeding neonates. I worked with university researchers studying both species of dolphins, but especially the rough-toothed dolphins, as we were the only facility with them. I became a lead, which is the equivalent of like a manager, in both the dolphin and sea lion areas, and also became the intern coordinator, as well as a new trainer mentor after several years. You can probably imagine a big part of my identity was related and intertwined in this career path I found myself on. Working for a small park afforded me the opportunity to be so close to the dolphins for so much of the time, sometimes unhealthy amounts of time. I was with the dolphins during long work days, shows, encounters, and special events. I kept an eye on them when they were sick or pregnant. I monitored the babies in ultrasounds. I was by their side when they gave birth. I've spent so many nights at the park watching them nurse their young and babysit each other's calves, or staying with very sick animals that needed constant care. I've had the opportunity to see so many baby dolphin births, I've lost count. I have been there for rescues and long-term rehab of dolphins. I've also been to many of their necropsies. For the record, I've never been okay with capturing wild animals for captivity. That stopped long before I became a trainer. I did and still do believe in rescue and rehab of animals in need, but always, always with the intent of releasing back into the wild. Release isn't really a priority, which we'll come back to shortly. I always thought of my position as a way to be their voice and did everything with what I thought was an animal's first approach. Here's a little disclaimer. These are my personal opinions based on my years of personal experiences with the animals that I worked with. Now, who is Sandy? In 1989, there was one last dolphin capture permit issued from the government for use in captivity before a moratorium on wild captures was to be enacted. This permit was issued for none other than Gulf World Marine Park and Panama City Beach. Sandy was one of four juvenile dolphins captured that day in St. Joe Bay, along with Delphine, Thunder, and Lightning. I worked with them all except Thunder, who passed before my time. Delphine was a specialist Sandy to me but died of a rare fungal disease after coming out of a pool. And Lightning, a very chill boy dolphin, is at the Mirage in Las Vegas. St. Joe Bay is about an hour from Panama City Beach, and the park chose to head to a town over to capture, so the locals where the park is located would not witness the event and be none the wiser to where the dolphins came from. Sandy was just a juvenile when ripped from her home and transported to a swimming pool across the street from the Gulf of Mexico. Now, this was long before I started, but old timers would tell stories about how often she would come out of the pool in those early years. Sandy was really choosy about who she let in. She was smart, obviously, expressive, stubborn, funny. Yes, funny. Once I heard an intern yelling for help as they were cleaning the acrylic windows, so I went to see what was going on. Sandy had stolen the sponge from the intern as she was cleaning the inside of the windows. And she was just parading around proudly with it on the tip of her rostrum. I loved it when she showed this side of herself. Take a sip of water. Sandy is the animal that undoubtedly shows anyone who meets her or knows her that someone is definitely home. She was over nine and a half feet long and weighed well over 400 pounds, so she was a solid, sturdy girl. I looked at my job as though it was to better the lives of the animals I worked with. I always loved enrichment and coming up with new ways to try to make their lives more engaging. When training new trainers, I used to tell them a, me a metaphor I came up with that I called the walk-in closet theory. The walk-in closet theory was something I came up with to express how important it was to give your all during animal sessions, and it goes something like this. Imagine you live in a walk-in closet. 
it's as nice as far as closets go. You get fed medical care, sometimes toys, and a few times a day that closet door opens and someone interacts with you. Wouldn't you hope that for those 20 minutes a few times a day, you would be given complete attention and engaged fully? I thought so. Sandy is still there. She's given the park many hardy offspring, including a difficult breech birth that survived. She was so strong and had something very coveted in the field, wild DNA. Side note, I recently read about a government study concerning the Gulf of Mexico dolphin populations, and I can't help but scoff and think of all the genetically strong offspring she could have provided the wild population instead of for the profit of many parks. As a trainer, I trained many things over the years that are typical of marine parks, show and encounter behaviors, as well as husbandry behaviors. My all-time favorite was something called Innovate. No specific behavior, the animal was free to do whatever they wanted. Sandy loved Innovate. She would come up with things I could never, never ever dream of training, crazy athletic combos, and occasionally brought me gifts like a bumblebee or a small plastic kid's toy that was stashed in a pipe. I still have these things to this day. Over the years, as I climbed the ladder, I worked with strandings, natural disaster rescues such as Hurricane Katrina and the BP oil spill and more. I gained insight into how marine parks and those making decisions affecting them worked in conjunction with one another. I firmly believe in rescue and rehab, but here's an example of how even in rescue and rehab scenarios, it's not always done with an animal first mentality. Rehabbed animals are deemed releasable or non-releasable based on the rehabilitation facilities recommendations, among other things. Only once during my many years there and hundreds of rescues was a dolphin slated to be released. His name was Dunham and his release was a failure due to the several marine parks and agencies involved and their desperate need for the notoriety of doing good. Dunham was a big, strong male that came to our facility for rehab and was finally ready for release after a couple of months. There were several organizations who had a hand in helping rescue, transport, and rehab him, and they all wanted some of the credit. He was transported to a place where all organizations could play a part and get some of that sweet PR. He was released in a bay during shark breeding season he was attacked and mortally wounded within minutes of release, only to be recaptured and euthanized. I was not on this release, thank goodness, but a couple of things stand out. Wouldn't you think the people deciding to release him would be aware of such things as shark breeding season in the bay he was transported to? This was hardly an approach that was best for the animal. It was best for publicity and credit for the organizations involved all because of greed. There were three rough-toothed dolphins transported from Texas for long-term rehab and released, never to be released. And in my opinion, they never intended to release them. Mr. Tim Zimmerman, you may know him from Blackfish, wrote a long reads article about the catalyst that made me walk away. He very kindly wrote about the empathy I had for the animals I worked with. The thing is, I have empathy for people too. There were good people in the field that really cared for the animals. Most were not, but there were some. I wish it were easier to have an open discussion about what is right for the animals, but it isn't the reality. Once you speak out, you become the enemy. I lost many friends because they were afraid of the backlash in their own careers if they even associated with me. People who were by my side and supported me when I left are now long gone. People say they believe one thing, but not enough to stay true to it. It's frustrating and sad. Imagine if after many years of blood, sweat, and lots and lots of tears, you realize you no longer align with the values of your career. It's difficult for sure. There were many tipping points along the way. After so many of them, as I worked my way up, I was forced to decide what I believed was the right thing to do. The industry is tight-knit, kind of a good old boys club. I was talking to a neighbor once during a neighborhood block party, 
and he said that the marine park industry reminded him of something like Scientology or a cult. He isn't wrong. There, they aren't exactly the same, obviously, but they have similar, excuse me, they have similar cultures of treatment of anyone who disagrees. This year's superpod is called Honoring Ken and Blackfish at 10. Ken Balcom's reputation preceded him. Just being here where he is being remembered is truly an honor. He was and still is a legend. I only wish I had had the chance to meet him. I remember exactly where I was when I first heard of the movie Blackfish. It was the end of the day. I was the head trainer, like a manager in the dolphin office. I was filling out logs and putting meds and vitamins out for the next day. One of our big bosses walked in and said something about a new activist movie coming out about killer whales called Blackfish. I remember in the moment thinking, whatever, they're mammals. About a week later, there was a New Yorker, I think it was like a New Yorker cartoon poking fun of Blackfish taped by the time clock and lunch area. I remember thinking that was kind of odd. Little did I know. So here we are, 10 years later. Sandy is still at Gulf World Marine Park generating income, producing offspring. I get my animal trainer fixed by training my rescued Siberian Husky, the difference between cheddar cheese and American cheese, and it's going pretty well. <laughs> I have compartmentalized my experiences and try hard not to think much of them. It's simply too painful. I don't see Sandy anymore. I feel like I've let her down. The love I felt for the animals I worked with is different than any other, different than a beloved pet and nearly impossible to describe. I am thankful for knowing them, and I miss them every day. In conclusion, I believe the following things to be true. Dolphin and whale captivity is a cruel and failed experiment. It's unfortunate it's such a profitable one. You can always follow the money. I believe wild captured animals could be returned to the wild fairly easily and it would, at the very least, be new and better experiment. The animals deserve to feel the natural seawater and rhythms of nature instead of chemical wastewater and the rhythmless, rhythmless existence of a walk-in closet equivalent. It's a complicated issue full of red tape, egos, and emotions, and there are a million subtle and gray areas. But if people could work together for what's best for each animal, amazing things can happen. During my years as a trainer, I've seen amazing things. I've seen terrible things. I love dolphins, who doesn't? In the end, this love is the reason I got into the business and ultimately the reason I left. Because when you know better, you do better. Thank you for your time. Oh, sure. I'm sorry. It's so hard to say. Okay. Questions? Okay. Um, my, I heard you say um, that you, Gulfport, received retired Navy dolphins. Mm -hmm. If they're retired, what are they doing in shows? So when they retire them, uh, Captive situations have like they can basically buy them, but it's pretty much classified what they did while they were in the Navy. They are generally pretty traumatized when they get to you. And the only thing I know about a couple of the dolphins that I worked with that were retired Navy dolphins was they did long term pressure studies. And that's it. So I don't even know what that could possibly mean. So, so effectively, they're not retired, they're repurposed. They're just, they're like past their, their point of usefulness for them. And so they sell them to, instead of like letting them go or whatever, they sell them to marine parks. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Hi, Amy. I have one. Yeah. You said that one of the males that you worked with had transferred to Marana. Is that right? Yes. Uh, what age did it do that and why? So he, I don't know his exact, his exact age. He was caught for our park. And then be, uh, wild DNA is super coveted in, in those situations, right? right? So they make kind of these deals where if you send 
your DNA dolphin, this boy dolphin, and if we have three babies, you get one. It, you know, they make all these kind of deals so that you can kind of keep the DNA going. Um, so he went from our park to the Mirage, you know, because dolphins are supernatural in the desert. <laughs> but, and he's still there, unfortunately. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. I actually don't know anything about that, especially if it was recent. Once I got out of it, you know, they don't give you any information. You're literally like cast out. So. Correct. You're welcome. Anybody else? I got a question. Okay. So I don't know that it was taught, but it sometimes would become obvious. I'll give you an example. We had a dolphin that was born there, and I would say probably out of boredom, when her session would end, she would throw up her last fish and play with it and throw it up and play with it and throw it up. Stuff it in a pipe, pull it out, play with it. But because our park had these big acrylic windows, people could see it. They didn't like the fact that people could see it, so they transferred her down to the Keys where they don't have acrylic windows. So she still has the problem, but people just can't see it now. So that's definitely an indication of a stressor to me. Yep. Sure. I was a trainer for 14 years, and before that I was kind of like a a very new, I wasn't really a trainer, but I had just started at the park for one year. So a total of 15 years. Can you tell us about any stereotypes that you observed in, in the dolphins? In the dolphins themselves? Yeah, when you were working with S Stereotypical behaviors, is that what you mean? Yeah. Um, I'm not really sure what you mean by that question. Did you see head banging? Did you see obvious other dolphins regurgitating? Oh, so we had regurgitating. We did not have head banging, but you know, some of them would, there were patterns swimming. They occasionally did come out of pools. Um, it, yeah, there were definitely some of them. I've been removed from the business for a few times, but for a few years, but I would think mostly like the regurgitation would be the biggest one that I used to. And some of them would just like swim in circles or, you know, stuff like that in the tank. Yeah, sure. Do they chew, uh, as what they do in captivity, do they, do they have the same teeth problems as orcas have? And do they chew on pipes or concrete like orcas do? So I don't, I don't know that it's as bad as orcas, but they definitely do their share of damage to their own bodies. And it's, it may not always be with the teeth, but you know, I, I think when you put the chlorine in the water, they are always sloughing their skin and they're trying to rub it off. And so they definitely do damage to their own bodies, for sure. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Is that everybody? Oh, I'm sorry, right there. It's so hard to see. Did you ever see any dolphin that had dolphin stress that they got to the surface and they were so I've never seen that specifically, but I have seen animals whose babies were stillborn or didn't live for very long, and the you know the carrying them around and pushing them around and stuff like that. And in a situation like that, uh, there would be a team that would be formed to jump in and take the baby away. You know, so that that doesn't necessarily allow them to do the natural like mourning process or what they do. So. 
Uh, they mostly would either get aggressive with the team trying to do it, or they would just watch. It depended on the dolphin, you know. But sometimes they would get aggressive. They didn't want it to happen. Yeah, you're welcome. Do you have your hand? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I noticed a lot of racing, and if so, how would that explain if the public asked That's a great question. Our animals were surprisingly clean. We did not have a ton of rake marks. Oh, she asked if there was a lot of rake marks on the animals and how we would explain that to the public, like if they saw a whole bunch of, you know, like scrapes or rake marks down their sides. Most of the time, our animals were fairly, they just didn't do that a whole lot. But when they did, we would just say something like, oh, they're playing, that's what you get when you're playful. Sometimes they would get like a little thing on their rostrum, like a little ding, and we'd be like, you know, they don't have hands to touch anything with, so they have to touch it with their rostrum. So there was always like these taglines that we were taught to teach the public, or you know, to tell the public, to kind of explain it away. Sure. Sure. Like enrichment? Well, we tried to mix it up, but of course there are shows that are scheduled, encounters that are scheduled. So you know, like in the winter time when we weren't as busy, we had a lot more leeway with that. But in the summertime, our schedule was tight. I mean, we ran like 12 encounters, three shows. I mean, so you know, you move the animals around and stuff, but it got pretty tight. We did try to do that for the most part. Um, we tried to make toys and, you know. They were, oh, not alone, like separately in each area. We, we had like groupings of animals that tended to get along, like we'd put the moms together, the, the boys together. Sometimes, I was the trainer who would just go and pull all the gates and leave, but <laughs> I did. I was like, they should all be together, right? So. Any, anybody else? One more over here. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yep. With a physical tube, is that what you mean? So my, my best guess is to hydrate them. Um, a lot of times that is what marine parks will do to hydrate them. We would only do that if we had a very sick animal that we needed to feed. We did not hydrate our animals, that way we fed them jello. Supernatural for dolphins. <laughs> um, so, but my best guess would be that they were hydrating them as the day started, because frozen fish also don't have the same hydration as wild caught fish, you know. So, yeah, that's right. Yeah, thank you. I think that's all of them. Yeah. Thank you, thank you guys. <laughs>